Absolutely. Jay Ferner, CEO of Quicken Loans, and it is a pleasure to be here. We've been catching up backstage, and one of the favorite ways I hear Quicken Loans described is a fintech company before fintech was cool, before we even knew what fintech was. Sure, I suppose. We've been probably uh, around more than most of the businesses here in the room, 34 years. Um, and I think we were focused on being a great client experience company and recognized that uh, technology was the key to accomplishing that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's been a big driver of our business for many years now. And Jay, when I was telling you how I was preparing for this, when I first got the call and said, would you sit down and do this keynote with Jay of Quicken Loans, I said, I'd love to, you know, but what do I know about mortgages? I cover tech in San Francisco, and it turns out, just as you said, you guys have used technology in such a way for such a long time that you've been able to grow your business, now the number one mortgage lender in the country, which is pretty remarkable. Tell me how you guys got there. Well, um, I think it was a recognition that to disrupt the space, we had to do things differently. So the market for so many years was based on small companies, um, really kind of hand-to-hand combat when it comes to working on mortgages, processing, underwriting. And so we took a step back and said, how do we centralize this business? How do we empower people in one or two locations to originate loans across all 50 states? And how do we build scale so we can go from a billion to five billion to 10 billion in a month uh, without affecting turn times? And so that led us back to technology and creating processes and thinking differently about how you work on a mortgage. And so in our case, one person can be working on 20, 30, 50, 100 loan files at one time. In the traditional mortgage process, it's usually, you know, one person shepherds a loan file through the process. Mm -hmm. And so we've kind of broke that down into to steps, and it uh, gave us scale, and it also helped us increase the quality of the loan, too. Right. And how did you see some of these trends before they got here? I mean, you guys really um, pioneered the quick mortgage loan. How did you know that that was something that customers wanted? And now you have a lot of competition in this space, and I think you guys have got it down to eight days. You can We can go as, as, as quick to eight to 10 days. I mean, on average, we're about 20 right now. Uh, with purchase, obviously, the speed to close isn't nearly as important. It's really about meeting the date that the, the you know our client needs to close. But um, you know, again, I think our focus wasn't necessarily um, doing it well, on, on, a, on a mortgage, as you go a delay through the process, typically only bad things can happen, right? There are, there are more things that can pop up or Snags. more concerns or a breakdown in communication. And so the, if you're able to close that loan quicker, it's really based on your increasing communication. You're talking to the client every day. You're giving them status updates. They're, you're, you're really focusing on transparency. And that's, I think, what's helped really get us to a faster close. Um, but that, that's probably, now, now our focus has changed a bit to a better experience, right? We're less focused on how many days and how happy the client is all the way through the process, um, taking what is traditionally not a favorite experience for people and turning it into something they can rave about. If you talk to our team members, they'll tell you that's, that's what's driving them. Yeah, I was going to ask you, what makes a good experience in this space? Yeah. Well, again, it, it's all about transparency. I think it's about, um, and we're pretty much known for this, but if you submit information, you can chat with us online immediately. We'll call you right back. Uh, we'll return phone calls 24-7, uh, or darn close to 24-7. All that information about your loan is uh, inside of that technology, mostly on the mobile app now. And, and now we're moving from thinking about it from a loan experience or a mortgage experience to a, a, a home experience. So we've launched a company called Rocket Homes. Mm -hmm. And, and so that allows us to really work through the purchase of the home, the title work, the appraisal, uh, uh, the mortgage, and the servicing. Because to a client, they don't think about those as separate things. They think about those as one experience. And so by controlling uh, or, or having partners that control that process from start to finish, we can bring the right information to the client at the right time uh, and, and make it a better experience for them. Now, one thing we were talking about backstage, too, is that you guys have been really steady, private company. Um, added products on, but not sort of at the rate of sometimes some of the other fintechs coming from Silicon Valley where they're in student loans and then home loans and personal loans. Um, has, that bit, has that focus, where does that come from? Is that something that because you sort of sit in Detroit instead of Silicon Valley, you guys are looking at making sure that you're well capitalized? And also, how do you see a lot of these companies coming up trying to do everything? Well, you know, it, 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 maybe it's a, for us, we looked at the market share. 
and we said to ourselves, if we control four or five or six percent of the market, there's plenty of room for growth without having to expand uh, our, our product selection. And then, and then we also looked at, are we really great at every piece of the mortgage process? And to, until the answer is yes, uh, we thought better to focus on that product and, and grow that market share and really make that experience great versus, versus confusing um, our, our team members on what's important. The other thing that you mentioned is we're privately held. And so we had a focus of never really taking on outside capital, uh, growing the value of our business internally, uh, and making sure that we're operating a profitable business. Um, how do you do that properly? How do you smooth out what traditionally is a business that has, that has big ups and big downs? How do you make that business more steady growth? Because the most valuable thing that you've got at most companies is your team members. Mm -hmm. And if your business is going up and down too much, it's hard to hold on to those team members. And so um, I think we put our heads down and said, let's build a great business that can be profitable, that allows us to reduce that volatility. Uh, and only recently when we looked and said, wow, we're, we're talking to millions of people a month at this point in time, and we're understanding more about the data and what they need, are there other products that we can, we can focus on? And how do those products weave together? Back to that one experience for the client. Mm -hmm. um, for them, that's important. That makes the, the entire mortgage transaction better. That's a reason to bring another product on board. Now, let me play devil's advocate, though. The flip side of being a private company, and as you know, this year we see so many of these unicorns go public, that is a way for their employees to cash out. So while when you become a public company, you know, that can affect morale and how the stock price is doing, it is a way for employees to cash out. It's, a, it's kind of remarkable that you guys have actually become the number one mortgage lender without needing to do an IPO. So are there any benefits? Do you spend time thinking about this? Yeah. Could it happen ever? Well, sure, anything could happen at, at some point in time. I think, you know, the value of our organization probably dictates that you might, you know, take it public if you were thinking about an exit versus uh, a sale to someone else. But back to the team member thing, which I think is critical, um, you know, as we talk to our team members and, and, and try to understand what's important to them, there's, of course, hey, am I taking care of my family uh, monetarily? Am I doing well? But there's also what's the bigger impact I'm having? What does my job allow the company or me to do. And so we've been really focused on that. And um, when we think about the footprints that we're in, Detroit and Cleveland in particular, investment in the community, uh, I think this year we'll put about $28 million to work helping uh, the communities that we live, work, and play in. Hundreds of thousands of hours that our team members uh, uh, you know, give to support the community, volunteer, those type of things. That's really resonated with our team members. And if you haven't been to Detroit in a while, you probably need to go because it's changed drastically in the last few years. But I think if you ask our team members what matters to them, of course they'll say, listen, I want to work on special work that, that's meaningful to the client. But after that, they'll say, I want to know that my work is having a broader impact. And they can see it. They can drive down Woodward Avenue or other, other roads and come to work, and they can see the difference that they're making in our city, the, the buildings that we're building, or the, the train that we're, we, we've put in, or the fact that the sidewalks are full of people, and 10 years ago they weren't. And I think that that's that's really meaningful to our team members, and that allows our retention rate to be great, and it's a bigger mission that we're all on together. That matters. So that's interesting. So you're saying essentially that Detroit could be a selling point. People, it is a selling point. And I live in Absolutely. San Francisco, so yeah. I know um, how difficult it can be for tech workers who are still making, you know, tons of money to live in that city. Yeah. And Detroit, I can attest that. I was telling you I was there a few years ago, and um, kind of blown away by what a great city, how yeah. beautiful it was. Um, but we, I'm just just to jump in. I mean, every day. We are bringing people to Detroit from the coast, particularly the West Coast, who are saying, a higher, better quality of life, um, my dollar goes farther, working on a very cool mission. And a lot of people have, have grown up either in the Midwest or in Michigan, and they want to return. And, but the, the, we used to be, you know, five years ago, we were reaching out. Yeah. Now the flow of resumes coming in is probably at an all-time high. So do you think you're competing um, for talent in the same way that some of the really hot fintech companies like a Stripe and a Square and a SoFi that are based in San Francisco, do you think that you're able to attract the same kind of talent, especially tech talent? Yeah. Um, well, so now that we've got uh, uh, companies uh, like Microsoft and, uh, and Amazon and others that are in Detroit, uh, there's certainly, you know, of course, there's the traditional Ford, General Motors. I mean, we've got a lot of competition now. And sometimes people will say to me, Jay, look, we've kind of created or helped create all this competition. It's making it more challenging for us. But I usually view that as a good thing, not a negative thing. Whether someone's in entering the mortgage space or we've got to compete on talent, it forces you and it forces your leadership team 
to get creative, to think differently. What value are you bringing? Uh, and that usually makes your company better. If you're, if you're not experiencing competition, sometimes you, you sit back and you don't innovate, and that's dangerous. So we welcome that competition. Um, I'm not sure it's quite as competitive as what, is, is what people are experiencing on the West Coast, but it's certainly been cranked up the last few years, and it's bringing I was gonna say, more talented people in. Because reducing talent, your relocation costs. Well, and, and talented people want to work around talented people. That's, your best tech people always ask, like, who else is working at your company? Yeah. And so when we were, were able to explain that we're recruiting from great West Coast companies, more people want to join the organization as well. Now you mentioned competition, and there's some really great questions um, here that from CB Insights readers, and one on competition. Uh, outside of competition from the big banks, startups, you got Blend, Better Mortgage, Open Door, Zillow. A lot of these companies, many more, are looking at different parts of the home buying process. So how much attention are you paying to them, um, even if they're sort of specific little areas that doesn't directly compete with you, um, but do they pose any kind of risk to you guys as the number one mortgage lender? So, so I think you have to pay attention to the competition. As I talked about, I think the right way to view it is not separate silos, here's real estate, here's mortgage, here's title. I think you've got to think about it holistically. And so if somebody's doing something great in the real estate space, I want to know about it. If someone's doing something great in the communication space between clients and realtors, I want to know about it. Um, you know, there's something to learn from, from all of your competitors, big and small. Um, and yeah, I, I think there are challenges that come with operating a business with you know, 16, 17,000 team members that a smaller startup, don't, they don't have to face those same challenges. And so if we're not very careful and pay very close attention and stay nimble while we grow, uh, then someone else, we create an, uh, an opening for somebody. So we, we're very focused on what the competition is doing. How do you keep your eye? Are you reading? Are you looking at potential acquisitions in the space? Is that one way of keeping an eye on the competition? Sure. So, uh, w yes, we look at acquisitions. We've made some acquisitions here over the last few years. Um, we are always watching, of course, media, PR. We're sending people to conferences like this. Uh, we're watching LinkedIn closely. I mean, LinkedIn's a great tool to to watch and, and see what your competition is doing and also reach out to your competition. We do that a lot and people are very happy to speak with us and learn about what they're working on. So um, it's, as everybody knows, it is critical. We, we, we were owned by Intuit for a very uh, short period of time. And so that gave us an experience um, regarding the West Coast and how competitive it was and how, how people moved from position to position and company to company. And I think we learned a lot there. Uh, taking some of those learnings and bringing them back to Detroit and, and you know, lifting our head up and saying, wow, we really got to pay attention to what's going on and make sure that if someone's doing this, our value proposition or the way that we're disrupting is better. Mm. I really like this answer because um, I hear a very different thing in San Francisco. The sort of Jeff Bezos school of thought is let's not worry about the competition at all. He says that often. Let's just focus on what we are doing. Um, whereas I think, you know, maybe being outside of the Silicon Valley bubble in Detroit, you maybe have a different perspective, which is very refreshing. But let's talk about Amazon and Jeff Bezos yeah, sure. <laughs> because, um, you know, rumors that it's going to move into mortgages, um, hired a head of mortgage lending. Amazon, sort of any talk I do, any industry, Amazon seems to be this sort of player that could or could not, if it yeah. wants to, put a lot of capital behind an yeah. initiative. Um, so are you thinking about Amazon, a very big company that doesn't do sort of a lot of mortgage um, business right now? How do you think about them and if they were to enter? They got huge field? reach, right? And, uh, and that's powerful. Um, we've invested strongly in our brand the last uh, decade or so to make sure that we've got big reach and the brand is well recognized. Um, so, so, of course, we're paying attention. And maybe back to your other uh, comment about focus. You, I, I think you pay attention to your competition because you should be in learning mode at all times. And you want to be aware of what people are doing because, uh, at least, I, you know, my philosophy is that you're never going to be the person who's got the market cornered on great ideas. Mm -hmm. Uh, it doesn't mean it, it doesn't mean you shift your strategy, but it means you understand what other people are doing and it can inform your strategy. Um, as I was telling you backstage, as a company gets bigger, it is really important to set strategy and stay with it because it takes a while to get the flywheel going to actually recognize the results. And too often I see people try something for a period of time and then they, they backpedal because they don't see those results, especially in the, the financial space. It takes a while. You've got to keep plugging away, keep grinding, and, and make sure those results are sustainable. So. It's not that you want to be dancing around, but you do, I think, want to be paying attention and learning. Um, 
now you're, you're kind of, I got off, off topic, so I apologize, <laughs> but your other question was. Does it, I guess then I can distill it down to this. Does Amazon keep you up at night? Yeah, see how I pivoted away from that? Um, <laughs> I didn't forget. <laughs> they have great reach. Uh, I am um, highly confident in our team's ability to create a mortgage experience that is second to none. Um, I also think that we have a really good understanding of how complex the space is. And having great reach is one thing. You've got to be able to reach millions of people. Processing, underwriting, and closing loans in all 50 states, in 36, 3700, whatever the number is now, counties with different rules, different traditions, real estate agents, brokers, all these different parties involved, it's complex. And so uh, we have made it our life's mission to be great at it. Uh, Amazon has a lot of things that they're doing right now. If I was sitting in Amazon's shoes and thinking strategically about where I wanted to place my resources, uh, I'm not certain that all of that complexity would be the best place for me to do so. And now to take a quote from, from Jeff, meanwhile, we will put our head down, focus on what we're great at, and uh, I think if you do that, things will work out. Right, so I think what you're saying is Amazon maybe has the reach, but it's such a complex business that you don't spend you know, a lot of time worrying about how they would enter. So what, in terms of competition, what worries you more, banks or fintech companies or technology companies? Um, I suppose, you know, it, that's a great question. Or I guess banks are calling them. <laughs> The, 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 yeah, I was going to say b banks. This this whole thing about fintech and bank, and so I, I think, you know, it's like when people say, "Jay, you're the largest online lender." I mean, that probably made sense 15 years ago. Everybody's an online lender now. I mean, so this this delineation is is interesting because very few people walk into a branch and do any banking today. Especially if you're talking to people under the age of 40, that's the opposite thing that they want to do. So, online, offline. Hey, you're the largest lender. You're not the largest lender. We happen to be both, I suppose. If you still want to look at those definitions. Um, banks have incredible reach, they have incredible power, and when they choose to get into a market, they will get into that market, um, you know, and you've got to be very aware of them. Uh, as we experienced over the years, as you're starting things up, you'll go from zero to 30. In finance in particular, you will hit some significant roadblocks. You'll have a choice. Do you push through those roadblocks? Do you, do you expand your technology? Do you get more involved in handling regulation? Do you change your management team? Or do you stop and say, now's a good time for me to exit this business? Um, maybe you push through to the next roadblock. Now you're at, at you know, you went from 30 to 50. Um, it's interesting to watch people and, and, and have them determine where that roadblock is that they want to exit. We kept pushing through, and so it's not that I don't think about smaller startups, but I think that in many cases people have different interests, and so they hit a roadblock one or they hit roadblock two, and at that moment in time, they find that an interesting place to exit. And one of our strengths is that we don't. We just keep going, and we think about disrupting, and so uh, you know, that gives me a, you know, a, a reason to at least pause and, and say to myself, you know, maybe, maybe that's not the place to focus the, my, my concerns, um, you know, uh, because I think people might take themselves out intentionally, and rightfully so, for the decisions that are important to them. What I'm hearing from you is sort of keep your eye on what's going on, but don't feel threatened by it. So always learning. It's a learning opportunity to look at your competition, big and small. Yeah, I don't think you ever want to be in a defensive position, yes. right? I, I think that's a mistake for any business of any size. You want to be, you know, aggressive, attacking, moving forward, taking care of your clients. You do, we all know this, but you take care of your clients and your team members. The rest seems to work itself out. I'd rather put most of the energy there. Be aware, but, but not uh, changing my business practices because of somebody else. Now, a few more questions. I thought you had some really interesting views on regulation, especially, certainly at CNBC, we're spending a lot more of our time talking about the sort of tech lash that we're seeing. And you guys are interesting because you've really sat at this intersection for decades now. You've had to comply with a lot of the same regulations that the banks do, yet you're also a technology company integrating a lot of technology. What advice would you have to some of the um, CEOs or some of the companies that are facing a lot of these questions? Yeah. Well, a lot of people in this room, I imagine, are probably in this, in this new position that has been coined non-bank. And it seems as though there's this discussion around, you know, bank versus non-bank and what's good for our economy and not good for our economy. And, you know, our, our point is that we're not certain that being an, uh, a person that accepts deposits and has FDIC insurance 
positions you better to serve the client and write great loans or mortgages or whatever you're in the space to do. Um, great technology, focus on quality, on QC, those things allow you to be a great organization. And I was talking to somebody the other day, I mean, 500 plus banks have failed in the last decade. So having a, you know, there are great banks, there are banks that aren't so great. Having the word bank by your name doesn't uh, make you any, any stronger. It's about client focus, quality, process. Those are the things that build strong lending institutions. Do you take advantage of not being in that highly regulated space or do you sort of work with regulators from the very beginning? Well, I, I would make an argument. We, we haven't logged the hours, but we probably face more regulation. If you're not under the uh, uh, charter of a bank, you've got all 50 states coming in every year, reviewing your processes from an origination perspective and from a servicing perspective. You've got the CFPB, you've got Fannie, you've got Freddie, you've got Jenny. I mean, there's not a day that there aren't you know, regulators in our office space. Um, and maybe back to your other question about uh, having a voice at the table, whether it's FinTech or uh, uh, you know, other technology, regulation will exist. You know, our team is embracing the fact that we have uh, a lot of valuable data and we need to bring so much value to our clients that they want to share that data with us because that will be regulated. We're all gonna have to face how we use that data. So I think it's critical that you, you take an active approach in educating both the state and federal lawmakers that you work with so they understand the business, they understand how it works. It's complex, they don't do it every single day, they got a million things to worry about. If we're not actively engaged in, in helping share the story about the value we bring to the consumer, we're gonna wake up one day and the consumer will be harmed and our businesses will be harmed because we didn't take the time to educate and work with lawmakers. So I don't think you can bury your head in the sand and pretend that that's not important. I think you have to play a, a big role in that. One last question before we get to the overrated, underrated game, which oh is my first time doing, I'm excited for it. But I think it's a really great question. Are there any startups or even larger companies that you think are doing a really great job in the lending space? And what is it about them that you admire? Yeah, um, I think there are quite a few. You mentioned better mortgage. I think that's really interesting. I think AI is critical. I think we're, we've got all this data. We're in an interesting space from a mortgage perspective because even though you know there might be a better way to originate a loan that's higher quality, that brings more, uh, uh, helps clients more, makes it easier, we've got to work with Fannie and Freddie to embrace that. Uh, rightfully so, they take their time to understand those things, but so, so I think there's some barriers there as well, but I like what they're doing. Um, I'm watching closely this intersection of, look, the last 10 years have been about kind of lead creation. If you, if you look at lending, online lead creation, whether it's Zillow or um, LendingTree or other uh, uh, platforms, they're bringing some transparency and, and value to the consumer and they're generating leads. And we've all benefited from that. But I think that experience is changing. Consumers are expecting more. And so uh, I, I'm really watching how how companies are, are thinking about combining that experience and making a one-stop shop for consumers while still making sure that they feel like they're getting the transparency that they need to make good shopping decisions. And that means more content, that means understanding that the consumer life cycle lasts for 12 to 24 months, not a day or two. Uh, and so I'm, I'm watching uh, content startups more closely, you know, like the nerd wallets. Mm -hmm. um, I think they bring value to the consumer and uh, it's, it'll be interesting to see where they go. Very interesting. Perfect lead into your overrated, underrated. So I'm just gonna give you a few names. Mm -hmm. You know how it goes, you guys know how it goes now. Um, you just mentioned them, Lending Tree. Uh, overrated, underrated, well, they're a great partner of ours. We work with them, so <laughs> Better be I'm, careful, I'm gonna say uh, properly rated. <laughs> that wasn't an option. All right, you're, you only get one of those. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Wells Fargo. You, you remember, oh you already God. used yeah, yours. You said up. you were going to do this. Um, <laughs> well, I'm, I'm as a direct I'm, mortgage lender. I'm going to say probably underrated today. They're a hugely powerful bank. They've had some challenges, but you know, you you cannot turn your head away from Wells Fargo. You're, you're being too diplomatic. Uh, mortgage back. These are all partners of mine. <laughs> okay, this is not mortgage backed securities. They're underrated, they're critical to the economy and wow. uh, they perform very, very well right now. Probably the best, uh, you know, when you look at the performance, of, and it's not because the economy has been so strong, the credit box is such that these assets are, they're very uh, valuable and I think they're the lifeblood of a lot of things in the United States of America. And wow. the thought of them changing or going away should make everybody very concerned. Okay, wow, that could lead us into another half hour discussion. Yeah. Um, but we'll move on, blockchain. It is overrated right now. Uh, we have a lot of technology folks in our company talking about ways to leverage it, but nothing has emerged yet. 
So it probably has potential, but a lot of the talk has been, can I just talk right now? Okay. Owning a home. I think it's underrated, uh, of course. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, Rocket Mortgage, we built it for millennials, for younger folks. Uh, and the activity on that website, we've just launched a whole info seeker path, is growing rapidly. There's more to it, and I know you want this question to be short, but this is an important <laughs> one. Some tax code changes, thought, people thought that was going to affect whether people want to buy a home. Not seeing it at all. Buying a home is an emotional decision. It's not a financial decision. It still makes a ton of financial sense to purchase a home, but people want to own a home. They like the stability. They like the certainty. They like the idea of creating something that's their own. And all of our research is showing us that people under the age of 35, maybe they got started building their, their lives a little slower than some previous generations, but they're on the same path. The same things remain important to them, and I think you're going to see them have a huge impact in home ownership in the years to come. Okay. So underrated. Mm -hmm. um, last two. Make them quick because we're out of time. Recession fears. <laughs> uh, overrated. Overrated. Yeah. Okay. Last one. Toronto Raptors. Uh, well, as a Cavaliers fan, I'm going to say, say, say the Raptors are underrated. And uh, I look forward to a uh, victorious uh, uh, Toronto uh, finish here. So. <laughs> I may or may not be from Toronto, so yes, I, I, think, I think that's a great note are, to end we, on. We've had our run-in with the Golden State Warriors as well, so go Toronto. Yeah, exactly. We're, we're kind of allies by default. That's right. Um, Jay, thank you very much, and please help me in thanking Jay. That was, you were Absolutely. great. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you.